So daily two for today, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, and let's get going with our daily two. And what we have is this one, which of the following is not a mechanical wave. Okay, a mechanical wave is a wave that needs a medium to travel through. And ripple on a pond is traveling through water, sound waves traveling through air, the P wave of an, earth, of an earthquake is traveling through the interior of earth. The only one that is not a mechanical wave is a radio wave. It can travel through the vacuum of space. So mission control in Houston talked to, uh, they talked to the um, astronauts in the uh, space station with radio waves, okay? Because they can travel through the vacuum of space. Um, an echo, an echo, if you're, you know, a quarter mile away from the cliff face and you bang two hammers together, that sound will travel to the cliff face, bounce off of it and come back to you. And that's an echo. And that is the result of reflection, reflection of a wave, okay? So that's reflection, which I see uh, most of you um, chose as your response. So that's good. All right, and that's the daily two. Questions, comments? All right, well, I want to um, talk about something called resonance uh, for the first part of this period, okay? And first thing I'm gonna do, I, I have this tuning fork, okay? Now, if I strike it, the tines begin to vibrate and that vibrational, th those vibrations are actually carried down the handle of the tuning fork. And if you if you put your something sensitive on the tip, you can actually feel it. Like for example, your teeth. You can actually feel the vibrations that the, that comes down. Okay. Now this tuning fork isn't very loud. Probably can't hear it there, but I can make it louder by 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 connecting the the uh, handle to the board like that. Okay, or the table. Perhaps you can hear that. Or I can actually attach it to this box. So I'm going to attach it to like this. And then when I strike it, the vibrations are going to be carried down and cause the whole body of the, of the, of the it's going to cause the wood to vibrate. And uh, I forgot to mention why. Uh, the reason it's louder when you touch it on the board or you touch it on the table is you simply have more things vibrating. Okay, this is something called forced vibrations. And I can cause that to happen with the wood. And I can cause the air inside, the, it's a hollow box. I can cause the air inside to vibrate with the same frequency. The net result of all that is you get something that's a lot louder, okay? This is something called forced vibrations, all right? And some musical instruments do this as well. For example, Here's a violin, okay? And the bridge of the violin transmits the, the vibrations of the strings, okay? Which wouldn't be all that loud all by themselves. It transmits it down to the body of the violin and it causes the body of the violin to vibrate as well. And, and since more things are vibrating, the sound is louder. And the, it sends the, the holes in the violin cause the air inside also to resonate with the strings. And if, if it's really good quality wood and it's made really well, it's a really rich sound, which is the sound of a well-made violin, okay? But the bridge transmits the vibrations of the strings down to the body of the instrument, forced vibrations, okay? An acoustic guitar, okay? An acoustic guitar, the vibrations are transmitted to the body of the, vi of, of the guitar and the air pocket inside makes the air vibrate as well. And so an acoustic guitar is a lot louder than say an electric guitar, which basically, <coughs> which basically the only things that vibrate are the strings. Okay, and that's not very loud until you, unless you amplify it, right? But an acoustic guitar takes advantage of this resonance effect. All right, and that's forced vibrations. Now, that wasn't good. One other thing that I can cause to vibrate is a glass. This is a wine glass, okay? And what I'm gonna do, 
pour a little water in it. About halfway. I'm gonna wet it, and then rub my finger around the edge. Come on. I've done this many times. A well made wine glass, the, the glass is crystal, is a very regular formation of particles. Okay. Not just like any old milk glass where the, where the glass particles are just um, in randomly oriented in in random uh, orientation. This is a very regular rotation, so regular arrangement of particles. And so it has what's called a natural frequency of vibration. The tuning fork has a natural frequency of vibration and a regular thing like a crystal glass has a regular, um, has a natural frequency of vibration. And by rubbing your, your finger around the rim, you can agitate the crystal at that natural frequency and it causes it to sink. If you look very carefully at the surface of the water, especially where my finger is, perhaps you can see the water vibrate as well. It's probably pretty hard to see through a camera. Maybe you can tell. Okay, so, so the, the crystal vibrates at its own natural frequency, okay? And this is called forced vibrations, all right? But it's not the only way that we can cause things to vibrate, okay? If I take my sound boxes like this, okay, and I have two of them, and <clears throat> if I strike one of them, and if the tuning forks are of the same frequency, then when I strike this one, okay, it will cause the, the body of the box to vibrate and the air to vibrate at 440 hertz. These are 440 hertz forks. That 440 hertz vibration will be transmitted to this one, okay? And it will also cause the air inside here to vibrate at 440 hertz. And since this tuning fork is, is tuned, tuned to vibrate at 440 hertz, this one can cause this one to vibrate, okay? This one is actually This one set this one into motion, which you probably can't hear because you're there and I'm here. If you were in my room, you would be able to hear it. So I uh, enlisted the help of YouTube to help me show this to you, okay? So since these two forks have the same natural frequency of vibration, agitating one can cause the other one to resonate with it because it drives it, it pushes it, it pushes it at just the right time. And so it can set this into motion. This is called sympathetic vibrations or resonance, okay? Right, but you don't need fancy equipment necessarily to show this. Okay, you can do this with again with glass with uh, wine glasses. Kids lab making science super fun and super simple. Today we're going to show you our singing glasses. This is a really cool experiment. And all you're going to need is two wine glasses, a cocktail stick, and some water. Take your two glasses and put them very close together, but not quite touching. Then pour some water into one of the glasses until it's about half full. Then carefully pour water into the second glass 
until it matches the level of the first. If you go too far, you'll need to pour some water into the first glass so that it matches. Make sure you're completely confident that the water level is exactly the same. They have to be tuned to each if other. If you prefer, you can measure the water beforehand. Then take your cocktail stick and place it carefully on top of one of the glasses. Then wet your finger and rub it along the edge of the first glass. Can you hear the glass singing? Well, that's because that as you rub your finger along the edge of the glass, it causes vibrations, which in turn create sound. And as you can see, the vibrations seem to be working in the second glass as well, even though they're not touching. Well, this is because the water level is the same in both glasses, and so their vibrational frequency is the same. When another object picks up the same vibrations as the first, we call this a sympathetic vibration. These tiny vibrations not only create sound, but movement as well, and that's why the cocktail stick seems to move all by itself. And there we have it. That is the amazing singing glasses experiment. Have some fun. Okay, and you can try this on your own. Not now, try it later uh, at home. Or, well, of course you're home. Try it uh, later on your own, all right? Now, if we could, so that, so that, uh, that glass, that second glass was made to vibrate, okay? Now, if we could somehow make the driving sound louder, then it would cause that second glass to vibrate with a greater amplitude. And it's theoretically possible to actually vibrate it enough to break the glass. Okay. And, um, and there was an episode of Mythbusters that uh, years ago that did this. So I'd like to show you that. has a natural resonance. This is the frequency at which it most efficiently turns sound waves into physical movement. Play a glass its own resonant frequency, but loud, and it may move so much that it explodes. They're using lead crystal, as it's the most efficient at transforming sound into motion. This lowest peak here is the is the fundamental frequency, and uh, I'm reading off here 562 hertz. So uh, that's where we should start. With the computer primed to belt out a pure 562 hertz tone, it's myth busting time. So this is MythBuster, MythBuster's wine glass breaking test number one. Simply playing a tone through the speaker to the glass. That's it. I'm really sorry. I need to actually plug that speaker into something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, details, details. Oh, Even the Meyer MythBuster can make mistakes. Let's try that again. Nothing. But in opera, it's not over till the fat lady sings and Rogers had a harmonious idea. When you listen to the glass, it has many harmonics above the fundamental frequency. And so maybe it's not the fundamental that breaks it. Maybe we need to produce one of those harmonics. Up to now, Rogers just been playing the fundamental frequency. But there are also many other equally spaced smaller peaks, the harmonics. So this time, the computer set to blast out the full harmonic sound, an exact match of the glass. Adam also throws a straw into the mix to help see if the glass is moving at all. Adam's straw dances. This glass really is vibrating. Just check out the high speed. The glass is as wobbly as jello, but not wobbly enough to implode. Back for his encore. Television. I'm this.
Ghostbusters exclusive. 556 hertz, 105 decibels, and 20 attempts makes for a world first. History's been made, and it's been captured on high speed. So there's really... So that professional singer was able to match the natural frequency of the glass and actually vibrate it enough to shatter the glass. Pretty cool. <clears throat> okay. Now, so objects in nature um, can have natural frequencies. Well, not, not necessarily objects in nature, but, but uh, ma uh, manufactured objects like glasses can have natural frequencies of vibrations as well. Okay. Structures can have natural frequencies of vibrations. For example, bridges. Okay. Bridges, because they're, if you look at them, they're oftentimes they're very rather regular. They can have a natural frequency of vibration. And so they can be driven to oscillate with sometimes um, destructive effects. Okay. Now, if you were in here, what we would do right now is to go, it would be to go outside and have a little demonstration in the in the hallway. And I would line you up. I would line you up two by two. And we're gonna play British Army. You guys are the soldiers and I'm the drill sergeant. And we're gonna go, we're gonna, it's, it's 100 years ago and we're, we're marching through the forests of Burma, okay? And, and then what, we get to a gorge and across the gorge is this rickety bridge, okay? Now, the soldiers, you know, British soldiers, they all march together, right? Boom, they all stamp. Marching through the forest with a very regular period, striking the ground at a very regular rate. Now, if those soldiers kept that, kept doing that uh, onto the bridge and the frequency of their march matched the natural frequency of the bridge, they could their, their, their foot stops could set that bridge into motion and, and more motion and more motion and more motion. And theoretically, the, the bridge would disintegrate underneath them. Okay, that would be bad, right? So when they did that, they had they had an order called break march. When they got to a bridge like that, they got they didn't do the regular hold stamping thing. Okay, they went off, or maybe they went random. I don't know, but they didn't keep that formation because they didn't keep that marching stuff going because they didn't want to match the natural frequency of vibration of the bridge because theoretically it could shake itself apart right underneath them, right? So bridges can have natural frequencies of vibration. Now you don't want them to, right? However, there is a bridge built in Washington about oh, 80 years ago now going on, actually a little more, in 1940 that had a natural frequency of vibration, okay? It was a, it's a bridge that spanned the, in Tacoma up in Washington. <clears throat> it spanned the Tacoma Narrows, which is a passage into Puget Sound, I believe. Okay, and this Tacoma Narrows bridge, well, let me just show you the video. Oops, uh, yeah, I do want that. Um, okay, I, gotta get, I have to get out of here. Out of here. And that's here. As you can see, this bridge was exceptionally long and narrow, over half a mile long, only 39 feet wide. It lasted just four months. During construction, we see the steel girders, eight feet tall, which were supposed to stiffen the bridge against bending. However, some up and down vibration was observed during the entire useful life of the bridge. Here's opening day. Now, what drove the uh, what drove the vibration was the wind, and it wasn't that strong of a wind either. It was about forty miles an hour, okay. But it matched the natural frequency of vibration of the bridge. Now. He said there was some up and down motion. What that means was when, when, and I've seen video of this too, in different video, the, you, the, the car, the, the bridge would do this. It would undulate like this. So the car in front of you would like over a hill and then come up again. Okay. It would go kind of like this. And I likened it to riding a roller coaster.
Okay. That wasn't a, that wasn't a necessarily freaky part though. It started this torsional torsion wave. Oh dear. Here I one again. Um, it started the torsion wave. On November 7th, the bridge suddenly went into a twisting motion. The wind speed was a steady 42 miles per hour. This was enough to keep the bridge oscillating in one of its natural modes of vibration with a period of five seconds. One casualty of this. I'll let him describe. Besides the bridge. A professor of engineering went out to see what had happened. He's coming back, walking with some difficulty along the nodal line, which is the center stripe of the roadway. That's, that's the equilibrium position, okay? The equilibrium position is the middle. He called it a nodal line. Remember, nodes are the place that don't move, right? And let's check this one. Look at that lamp post, they're like toothpicks. Okay, talk about amplitude, like six, seven, eight feet. All right, that's a lot. It's remarkable that the girders were this flexible. This is photographed at normal speed. However, a collapse was inevitable after a little more than an hour of this. Is it dust or a crack in the concrete? The car had been abandoned earlier. No one was injured in the whole affair. However, a small dog in the car was frightened and was afraid to come out and he perished along with the bridge. The bridge ultimately shook itself apart. Now, after this, the wind tunnel was invented and the, the, uh, any structure like a bridge, before they ever built it, they put a model of it in, in the wind tunnel and they would, and they would uh, change the, the wind speed to see if, if it would do the same thing to the Tacoma Narrows. They actually made a model of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, put it in the wind tunnel, and they found those natural frequencies of vibration. The model did the same thing as the real one did, okay? And so now, before they, before they ever build it, they test it in the wind tunnel to see if it has natural frequencies of vibration because they don't want that to happen again. They built a new bridge, uh, you know, they, they built another bridge and um, you can go over it, you know, I've been on it because uh, I visited there, I had to go over the Tacoma Narrows Bridge um, and it's safe, you know, it's perfectly fine because they, they did better testing on it, okay? So structures can have natural frequencies of vibration. Buildings can have natural frequencies of vibration. Um, if you're going to build a 30-story building in San Francisco, I don't even know if they have 30-story buildings there, but if you, if you build... Yeah, they probably do. If you, if you build a structure like that, you have to make it as earthquake proof as you can. And if there's even a, a rather minor earthquake, but it matches the natural frequency of vibration of the building, the building can, can be driven to shake itself apart. So they, they're very aware of that. If you become an architect of such, of such buildings, you will be very aware of natural frequencies of vibration and you will, you'll, build your building so it doesn't have them or it has competing ones so they damp each other out or something like that you must be very aware of those natural frequencies of vibration um, otherwise it can have uh, incredibly destructive results okay all right and this resonance uh this this idea of resonance is is vital or instrumental pardon the pun in the production of music okay and that's what i want to talk about now the physics of music. Okay, so I'm going to share once again, and I want to go through the physics of music. All right now, 
<clears throat> Here's the musical scale, okay? And I don't know who invented this. It was invented hundreds of years ago by, you know, Beethoven and company, or before that, I don't even, I don't even know, honestly. Okay, but they, they settled on, on, and they called eight notes in a musical scale, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, right? And they called it an octave. And they, they use letters to designate the tones, okay? And 256 is designated as middle C, okay? And I'm never going to test you on these frequencies. Don't, don't worry. I'm, not, I'm never going to, you know, you don't have to memorize this, okay? But what I want to do is um, I want to get out of here for a minute. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I want to get... Uh, um, I want to get uh, play these tones for you, and so I have these uh, on. Oh yeah, I had to get out of the video. Okay, that's what it was. So here is middle C. That's two hundred fifty-six hertz. Okay. Now here is one octave higher. Okay, perhaps you, all right, those of you trained in music. Can you detect the, can you detect the, um, can you detect the octave? Give some feedback. Can you guys detect the, the uh, octave between the, the, between, um, this one. Okay. So that's an octave. Now, what's interesting to me is they, they worked this stuff out <clears throat> a long time ago, right? But way years and years before they could actually measure the frequency of vibration of the, of the note. Okay, uh, of the fork or whatever was producing it, the string, they could they could measure that or they they heard it years and years before they actually were able to measure the frequencies. And what's interesting to me is that if you if you once they did, what they found was that the decimal C this is an octave higher. And the frequencies are exactly doubled. The frequencies are exactly doubled. Why? How, how does it work like that? I don't know. Our brains perceive an octave rise in pitch if you doubled the frequency from 256 to 512. That's, that's kind of strange and kind of cool that our brains would perceive that, okay? If you double it again, you get another octave, okay, which I will play for you now. Um, let's see, let me get out of here and get back to, get back to, so get my toolbar out of the way. So here's 256, here's 512, and here's 1024. Five twelve thousand twenty four. Okay, I think that's really cool, and that's uh, really the only thing I'm going to test as far as testing goes. That's the only thing I'm going to test you. You know, if you double the frequency, it's an octave rising pitch. Other than that, you don't have to you don't have to memorize any of these numbers. Okay. There's something also kind of cool about this harmony. Two notes that are in harmony are say G and C. I'm going to play G and C together. All right. And toolbar keeps getting in the way. So here's G and here's C. Okay, oops, wrong one. So C and G. Those two notes are in harmony. Okay. Now, if you, and so, and they worked that out many, many years ago. But now check this out. 
Good to hear. Now, check out the, uh, the frequency of, of G is 384 hertz. And the, the, the uh, frequency of middle C is 256. And if you take the ratio of those, 384 over 256, and you break it, you break down this fraction, it breaks down to three halves. Okay. Uh, e is another note that's in harmony with C. Uh, G and C, E and C. These two sound pleasing together. And if you break down this fraction, it breaks down to four thirds. Okay. Or not four thirds. I think five over four. Let's see. 160, 128. I've forgotten, so I have to take four out of there. Take four out of there. Five over four. It breaks down to five over four. In other words, it breaks down to a fraction of small whole numbers. Okay. And two notes that are in harmony that sound pleasing to us, if you break down their frequencies, they're ratios of small whole numbers. You know, I think musicians have talked about this like thirds and fifths and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm not trained in that, so I don't really know. But, it, but the two notes that sound good together have ratio, they're, they have frequencies whose ratios are small whole numbers. To me, that's really super cool. You know, what is it about our, you know, they, 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 they knew about the harmony and, oh, wow, these two notes sound good together to our brains. It's pleasing to our brains. They knew about that way, way, way before they knew about this, okay? It just turned out to be this. And I think that's really super cool, okay? And I was reading about this one time, uh, about this effect, and, it, and uh, the, the author said that it's because our brains like order. You know, our brains like orderly things. And these are, these are very orderly. You know, like an octave, 500 and, 512 over 256, that two, nice, nice and orderly, all right? So it sounds good to us, all right? So it's a product of our brains. So uh, if, if two notes sound, if you play them together and it's just, not harmonious, like just noise, their, their frequencies uh, don't break down to small home numbers, right? So I just think that's really cool that, um, that it works out that way, yeah? Okay, <clears throat> all right. Now, uh, I'm gonna share once again because I actually wanna start talking about musical instruments, okay? And I wanna start, I wanna talk about vibrating strings, okay? So we have a vibrating, we have a string that's vibrating between two, two ends. And an example of this that I'm gonna use is, the, is a guitar, which I will get to momentarily. Okay, now, the, the guitar is clamped at, the string of a guitar is clamped at either end. Let's say it's a, the ends are a distance L apart. Now this string vibrates and there, there's a standing wave gonna be set up in the string. Crest is going to bounce, fixed end as a trough, fixed end as a, as a crest, as a trough, and it's just going to keep going back and forth or resonate. Now, the frequency that we hear or the pitch that we hear, which depends on frequency, depends on V equals F lambda. Okay. The wavelength in this particular case is fixed. Okay. The wavelength is just related to the distance between the ends. So to change the pitch, to change the frequency, you have to change the speed. Okay. And there are three ways to do that. Well, actually, to, to change the pitch, we, th we can change the speed. And there's two ways to do that. One, change the tension in the string, okay? Change the tension in the string. I'm gonna stop sharing, okay? Ch I'll bring it back momentarily, okay? Uh, change the tension in the string. And that is done with these tuning knobs, okay? Okay? And that's the same effect as me when I was doing it with the spring, you know, pulling in a bunch of string to spring to make it more tense. Okay, and that changes the speed of propagation, which will change the frequency. Okay. As far as I know, there's no, no nobody plays a guitar by changing the tuning knobs. That just doesn't happen. Okay. So, but you could theoretically. Okay. Instead, what we could do is we could. Instead of changing the tension, we could change, uh, you could use a different string, okay? Material, right? And this is why, uh, for example, we have six strings in this guitar and they're made of, they're, they're, they're different, okay? 
this one is a lot thicker than this one. Okay, and the uh, that's why they have different pitches. This uh, thick one, the speed of propagation is a lot less because it's harder to move, and so the pitch is lower. If V goes down, then F goes down, and the pitch goes down. This string here, a lot easier to move. The speed's a lot faster, okay? And, uh, and because the speed is different, the pitch is different. Now, a, a bunch of guitar playing is done by this. You all play different strings to get different pitches, okay? All right, so that's a, that's a normal thing for a guitar player and a violin player. I'll just stick with the guitar for now. All right, but there's one other way, okay? And the, oops, uh, now I did it. Um, I gotta get back to my, I, I uh, gotta share the screen again. There's one other way, okay? And that other way is to, is to change the wavelength. And that is done by changing the distance between the ends. And that's the vast, that's the vast, that's a large part of guitar playing too. And violin playing and cello. I don't wanna, I don't wanna not mention them, but I'll just stick with the guitar because I have one right here. Changing the distance between the ends by moving your fingers up and down the neck, okay? And pressing down on the string, then your finger creates your finger creates one of these ends. And by changing the wavelength, you change the distance, you change the uh, pitch, okay? In that case, if you stick with one string, the speed stays the same, but by reducing the, the wavelength, by reducing the wavelength, you increase the pitch or you increase the frequency and therefore the pitch, okay? And that's, uh, that's how a guitar string works. Oh, by the way, this is also interesting too. Um, we create, <clears throat> I'm creating sounds using my vocal cords, my vocal cords, right? Vocal cords. Now, question, question for you. In general, boys' voices have lower pitches than girls' voices. Why is that? Why, in general, are boys' voice, boys' voice, boys' voices, hard for me to say, lower pitch than girls. Well, it has to do with the vocal cords, okay? Now, when we're kids, kids, like seven and eight, we're pretty much the same. But when boys go through puberty, their, their body changes and their vocal cords get both longer and thicker. And it's the longer and thicker, in general, it's the longer and thicker, thicker vocal cords of boys that cause their voices to be lower pitched, okay? It's not universally true, but in general. All right, it has, it, it's all about um, thickness and, and boys voice, the vocal cords are a little bit longer, okay? All right, so that's interesting. Um, okay, so that's, that's strings. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. So with this guitar, just staying on the bottom string, right now is that, but by changing, making the distance shorter, you get, a, you get a higher pitch, okay? And if you go exactly in between, okay, which is noted by these two dots on the, on the neck, okay, you can hear an octave. If I clamp it down halfway, that means I'm cutting the wavelength in half. And if I'm cutting the wavelength in half by V equals F lambda on the same string, cutting the wavelength in half will double the frequency. And I should hear an octave. Okay. And that's the vast majority of guitar playing. I can't play, but I can play a few chords and they have it, they got it figured out just right. So that if you, they all, if, if it's, they're all within reach, this isn't, I didn't tune this. I, I probably untuned it when I was messing with the tuning the knobs, but you can have all six strings playing harmony if you do it just right. And they have this figured out, okay? Okay. All right. Now, what I want to do is I want to make this. I want to make a drawing on the board, okay? And so I'm going to have a a uh, see, vibrating strings. If 
you want to draw this with me, you can go ahead. You can, although it's in the PowerPoint. Okay, it's in the presentation. So what I'm going to have is a couple of ends here. Okay, and they're going to be a distance L apart. Okay, now I'm going to have a string in its most fundamental mode of vibration. The 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 sing the the least complicated one is where it has just one crest between the ends. And it will reflect as a trough and it will come back like this. Okay, one crest and one trough. And then I'm gonna have over here in the right hand side, I'm gonna have three columns. One is gonna be for the wavelength, lambda. One is gonna be for the frequency, F. And the third one is gonna be what I'm gonna call the mode. Mode. So if you're drawing this with me, okay, that's what you should draw. Okay, now, if I take this string, notice that there's only one crest here. If I want to get the entire wave, I'm going to draw in the trough, like that. So now we have one complete wave, a crest and a trough. And that wave, since L is half of that wave, the entire wave has a wavelength of 2L. The entire wave has a wavelength of 2L. Let me zoom in a little bit. The entire wave has a wavelength of 2L, okay? I'm gonna call this frequency F, and that's called the fundamental. It's the most fundamental mode of vibration that you can have in a string, but it's not the only one, okay? It's not the only one. I showed this with the, uh, when I first started talking about standing waves, I showed this with the spring, and maybe I will a little bit later, time permitting. Um, but right now I'm just gonna sketch it. Now here I had uh, just a crest in, in, in the, between the ends. Now I'm gonna have a crest and a trough. A crest and a trough, okay? And it's gonna hit there right at the node, and so it's gonna come back like this, okay? So now if I have, if I highlight one complete wave, a crust and a trough, there I have one complete wave, okay? Note that it has a wavelength now of L. It's the same as the distance between the clamps. So the wavelength is L, all right? Now, what about the frequency? Well, I took the wavelength and I cut it in half, okay? I cut it in half. And by V equals F lambda, by V equals F lambda, I'm taking the V to be a constant because it's the same string. If I cut the wavelength in half, then I double the frequency. I double the frequency, okay? This is called the first harmonic. Okay. No, the slideshow says second harmonic. Second harmonic. Thank you. The fundamental is called the first harmonic. Some teachers call this actually the first overtone, but but it, it never, yeah, thank you, Henry. Um, so second harmonic. Now, you can get, now I can play this on a guitar and guitar players, I invite you to try this. I invite you to try this. Instead of clamping your finger down, halfway between, okay? Instead of clamping it down, just very lightly touch the string. Just very lightly touch it because then you're forcing the string not to vibrate there. You're creating a node right there, okay? Hopefully you can hear this. Oops. Can you hear that? Anybody hear that? Yes, no? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear that. Yes, okay. Now notice. That's an octave. Okay. 
Now, and it just continues to resonate, right? And guitar players, I invite you to try this. Just very lightly touch the string and you can get that mode, okay? And it's vibrating like this, okay? That's called the second harmonic. <clears throat> and now, but that's not, again, that's not the only mode that I can get. I'm gonna have two more of these, by the way. Here I have one note in the middle. Now I want two. I want two nodes in the middle. Okay. If I highlight one of these waves, a crest and a trough, all right, now the wavelength of this wave, the traveling wave that produces that is two thirds of the way across. There's a third, there's a third, there's a third, two thirds. So the wavelength of this traveling wave that produces this standing wave is two thirds out. Or writing it a different way, 2L over three. And now I've taken the fundamental wavelength and I've cut it into a third of its previous value. The fundamental wavelength is now a third. And if the wavelength is a third, the frequency is three times. This is called the third harmonic. You can actually produce this on a guitar. And you, you only need to put your finger at one third of the way down. You don't even have to form both notes, just one. And the other one will be set up automatically. Okay, and I can do that too. Here's the fundamental. Second. Hopefully you can hear that. That's the third harmonic. One more. And here's where I'm going to have not two notes in the middle, but three. If I highlight one of those, notice that it, the wavelength of one of these waves is halfway across. So the wavelength of this is lambda over two, one half lambda, lambda over two. Check that, I'm sorry, L over two is L over two. Or writing this a different way, two L over four, okay? I have taken the fundamental wavelength and I'm I now have a quarter of that, okay? And if it's a quarter of that, that means the frequency is 4F and that's the fourth harmonic. I can also play that on the guitar. It's pretty faint though. I'm not sure you're gonna be able to hear it. Right there. Now, for you musicians, note that from F to 2F, it would be an octave. So, so if this was a C, then the second harmonic would be C prime. Note from 2F to 3F, it is not doubling. So that's not an octave, that's actually G. But going from the second to the fourth is another octave. for you musicians. So, fundamental, second harmonic, fourth harmonic. Hope you can hear that. The octave rise from the second harmonic to the fourth. Okay, and so you can set up all these different modes of vibration in the string, okay? All right, questions? Okay, now, 
I'm going to, whoops, I didn't, really didn't want to do that. I want to keep that there. Uh, and I want to do an example. And this example is located in the PowerPoint. So let me, let me share this uh, screen. So I got this and then in here, I got all this that I just wrote on the board. Okay. And now I want to do this. A guitar string has a length of 0 0.8 meters between the clamps. Find the wavelength of the fundamental mode of vibration. Now, if you don't want to write this stuff down, I actually have this in Schoology in the, this, this week's folder. Go down to music examples. Okay. And this week's folder is music examples. And I'm doing number one. And so maybe you want to print this sheet off because I'm going to be using these examples through the course of the next, um, the course of the next, uh, uh, couple days. Okay. So a guitar string has a length of 0 0.8 meters between the clamps. And so I'm going to do this example. It says, draw the fundamental and then find the wavelength of the fundamental. Okay. So stop sharing now and then we're going to do this. So we're going to find the, so I'm going to draw it and then find the wavelength. Okay. So sketching it, it's going to look like, it's going to look like that. That's the fundamental. Okay. There's 0 0.8 meters between the ends. Okay. That hopefully you can see that. Zooming in a little bit. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to find the wavelength of this. Well, looking back on your, you know, you can use this screen as a as a reference, and I kind of Took it away. The wavelength is 2L. Okay. So the wavelength here is 2L, which is 2 times 0 0.8 meters. And this wavelength is 1.6 meters. So the wavelength is 1.6 meters. Okay. All right. Part B. Let's check out part B. Part B says, um, part B says that if the waves travel at 512 meters per second in the string, okay, find the fundamental frequency. So in the string that the wave is traveling in, the speed is 512 meters per second. B is equal to 512 meters per second. And what I want to know is, what is the frequency? Okay. Well, we're going to use V equals F lambda for that. Okay. V equals F lambda. So V is equal to F lambda. And I want to find the frequency. So I'm going to divide out the wavelength. Dividing out the wavelength. And cancel, cancel. And I get frequency is equal to speed divided by wavelength. Speed divided by wavelength. Okay. Zoom in a little bit. Yeah, see that? Yeah. So this is going to be 512 meters per second over 1.6 meters. 1.6 meters coming from our earlier stuff. Calculators. What is 512 divided by uh, divided by um, 1.6? Jack says 320. Is that confirmed? Did he hit the right buttons on his calculator? Yeah? Okay, thank you. 320. Frequency. 320 hertz. You musicians, that's the E string, guitar players. 320 hertz. Okay. Next question. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Find the frequency of the sound wave of the sound wave produced by this string. That is, when the sound gets into the air, what is the frequency of the sound wave? All right. Well, two ways to figure this out, or two ways to get this answer. Number one, just check out the E string on the guitar. 
it's vibrating up and down. Every time it vibrates up, it compresses the air. Every time it goes down, it rarefies the air. So every compression of the string, every, sorry, every oscillation of the string up creates a compression. Now, if this, if this string oscillates up and down 320 times every second, it's gonna create 320 compressions in the air per second. And that the 320 compressions per second means that the frequency of the sound wave is also 320, okay? Every time the string goes up, it compresses the air, all right? Creating a sound wave. 320 um, times up and down, 320 uh, compressions per second, 320 hertz. So the answer is 320 hertz. And then here's another, here's another way to figure that. Remember what I said? What property of a wave never changes? no matter where it goes. The answer to that is frequency, right? I've been hammering on that. It doesn't matter if it goes from the string into the air, okay, or for warm air into cold air, or if it goes into rock or water or whatever, the frequency of a wave never changes, okay? So therefore, frequency, is 320 hertz. Unchanged, never changes. Okay. Then finally, uh, part D, part D, um, if the air temperature is 24 degrees Celsius, find the wavelength of, find the wavelength of the sound wave in the air. Okay, the wavelength in the string, the wavelength of the wave that was going through the string was 1.6 meters. But now we're in the air, okay, different medium, all right? And so the, the speed is going to change, and so the wavelength is going to The frequency stays the same, 320 hertz. But now, for part D, we're going to use V equals F lambda again. Okay, we're going to use V equals F lambda again. And I can find the speed from the temperature. Temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. So I need to find the speed. Um, I'm going to use V equals F lambda. And the V can be found from our relationship 331.5 meters per second plus 0 0.6 times the temperature. Okay. All right. And uh, inserting our values, 331.5 plus 0 0.6 times uh, 24. Um, let's see, 0 0.6 times 24, I'll move the decimal point, six times 24, uh, six times 20 is 120, six times four is 24. Add those together to get 144. Uh, move the decimal point back, and we get 14.4, I think. And then adding that to this, we get 349. Point, uh, no, that's wrong. 345.9 meters per second. Okay. That's our speed. Then we're going to use this in, remember what we want. We want to find the wavelength, right? So we're going to use V equals F lambda. And if I want lambda, I'm going to, I'm going to divide out the frequency. And so what we get out of that is that the wavelength is equal to V over F. And we have 300 and 45.9 meters per second over uh, the frequency, which is 320 hertz. 320 hertz. Okay. Remember that a hertz is a one over second. So the seconds are going to cancel themselves out and I'll just be left with meters. Calculators, what's 345.9 divided by 320? And let's keep three sig figs. 
confirmed 1.08 1.08 thank you so this is 1.08 uh 1.08 meters okay how far apart is 1.08 meters you know it's about not far so one compression one rarefaction Okay. All right. There's a part E to this. Find the wavelength and repeat for the um, second harmonic. And the only th where we would start there is we would get the wavelength. And the wavelength wouldn't be 1.6. Instead, the, the, the wavelength of the second harmonic would just be L. So the wavelength there would be 0 0.8 instead of 1.6. And then you go through this whole business again, okay? But I don't really have time to do that, so I'm going to I'm going to not do that. Okay, so that's an example. That's an example of, of how music is produced in guitars and cellos and violas and violins and stuff like that. Um, stringed instruments, ukuleles. What I would like you to do next time for. Uh, for Friday is I want you to bring your musical instruments to class and I want to I want you to want to hear it I want to hear them. that's that's a really super fun part of this unit is to have students bring in their instruments and of course actual musical instruments are more complicated are more complicated than um than just these little simple examples I'm doing but these are the fundamentals of them do they have to be stringed instruments? Well, we, act, we are actually going to be talking about wind instruments next. Um, trumpets, trombones, uh, the brass instruments. And then we're also going to be talking about the woodwinds, okay? Because they're different. And if we get to it, we can even do percussion, okay? Because all of this, all of these involve standing waves, okay? Without standing waves, we don't get music, all right? And so this is really, and music is, Pretty important to me. I listen to music multiple times every single day. So and I think I can't imagine a world without music. Um, and so that's why this kind of touches home for me, this whole standing wave thing. All right, now I have a I have homework for you. So I'm going to share. And uh, the rest of the day today and tomorrow, I would like you to work on you, and you can find this in the in the same place. You can find it in the um, this week's folder, okay? This is kind of your tomorrow assignment, all right? You're gonna be working on sound worksheet two, all right? Um, and let me just open that. Um, sound worksheet two. I'd like you to do number one, which is a Doppler effect problem, okay? Use our example from last week to do that. Uh, and then two and three, okay? Two and three. And this is um, kind of like what we just did. Number four and five involve closed tubes like a trumpet and open tubes like a flute. Don't do that yet because we don't know. You don't quite know how yet. Um, at least I haven't taught it yet. So for, for tomorrow, I'd like you to do one, two, and three. Should take you about, uh, might take you 20 minutes, maybe. But you have a half an hour tomorrow during class time. So you should be able to finish this and submit it to Schoology for assignment points. Okay. That's due at the end of tomorrow. All right. And then we'll go over them on Friday and then keep going. All right. Okay. So yeah, bring your musical instruments to class next time. And I'd like, uh, uh, well, stringed instruments. Let's stick to stringed instruments right now. And then we'll do wind instruments next. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that pretty much does it for class today. Are there any questions, comments for me? All right. I look forward to hearing you play because I do not, I played the piano when I was a kid and, uh, but I did not play any, which I suppose you could call a stringed instrument. I suppose you could, but otherwise no. All right. Well, I will let you go then. You guys have a great rest of your day 
and uh, tomorrow, and I will see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Put the music on. Mr. T. Yeah. I was wondering if you could give me a